Okay, so you want to start studying philosophy, and the first thing you need to figure out is what kinds of books you're going to read. Now, I've tried to make a few videos like this before, and what I've found pretty consistently is that I've probably made it a little bit too difficult. And I have found five books that I think any beginner in philosophy can read. And I think if you read them in this order, you're going to see why they're valuable, and you're going to learn a lot about philosophy along the way. And my hope is that once you've read these books, you're just capable of going and reading as much philosophy as you want on your own based on whatever interests you. So the first book I'm going to recommend is by Plato. Instead of recommending the complete works though, I am going to recommend this, this little collection of dialogues published by Hackett that's just called The Five Dialogues. Now, Plato himself did not group these into five dialogues. We've done that later, but all of those dialogues are just very good as teaching text, and they have been taught in so many introduction to philosophy classes, so they are really great for beginners. Now, you could read any of the dialogues or all of them, but the one I'm going to recommend the most is the Euthyphro. In the Euthyphro, Socrates is on his way to a trial. You see, Socrates is going to actually be put on trial and eventually executed for allegedly corrupting the youth in Athens. On his way to the trial, he encounters a priest, a kind of religious figure named Euthyphro, who is about to go prosecute his own father for doing something wrong. Now, at the time, this was quite a scandalous action. You wouldn't expect a son to prosecute a father because they expected a certain amount of filial piety. But Euthyphro tells Socrates that he feels okay with what he's doing because he understands what piety is. He is an expert in matters of religion and morality. And Socrates decides that he's going to ask Euthyphro a couple of questions. So they start having a debate about how you can know what is right and wrong, how this relates to religion, how this relates to the gods. And Euthyphro eventually gives a definition. He says that goodness is that which is approved by the gods. And this is where he gets into trouble because Socrates is going to ask him a very difficult question and he's going to struggle to answer that question. And that question is, is something good because the gods approve of it or do the gods approve of it because it is good. This is a famous dilemma, actually. It's called the Euthyphro Dilemma, and philosophers reference it quite a bit when they are thinking about how difficult it is to come up with proper definitions of things. If goodness is a matter of the god's approval, then it would seem that goodness is kind of arbitrary. If the gods change their minds, as they often did in Greek myths, then it would seem as if what is good and bad could just swap places. And so who really cares about goodness and badness in that case? And if the gods approve of something because it is good, then it would appear that Euthyphro has not given a definition of goodness. Instead, what he has done is just found a way to identify goodness, which is different than knowing what goodness is. Because we could also ask, how do the gods know what is good? When I would teach introductory philosophy classes, this is one of the first texts that I would assign. And because it shows students how philosophy ought to be done, and it introduces them to an idea called the Socratic method. Now in the Socratic method, what happens is one person puts forward a theory, a definition, or a hypothesis. And then after that definition has been put forward, interlocutors will try to challenge it. They will ask difficult questions. They pre present counterexamples. And then we have to try to iterate and improve the definition over time. Now, a lot of times in Socratic dialogues, the interlocutor will just get frustrated and you will never be given a proper answer at the end. And that is another valuable lesson to learn. Philosophy does not always give us clear cut answers, but it does help us at least ask better questions. The second work I recommend is the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Now, I will admit Aristotle is not the easiest to read. The prose are not great. However, this is probably my favorite work of philosophy, and I've taught this book in particular to lots of undergrads, to lots of people in introductory classes. It usually meant that we had to read things slowly, and we had to try to figure out the meaning of individual sentences together, but it was a really valuable process for those students, and the book is just so good. Now, I recommend this book in part because a lot of students, when they come into philosophy, are interested in ethics. They really are interested in these questions of what is right and wrong? What is good and bad? How can I be a better person? And Aristotle is giving us a very intuitive way to think about ethics. In particular, he is basing this on the ideas of teleology, which is where we measure actions or the rightness of wrongness of things based on goals or intentions or purposes rather than causes or simple consequences. 
And he's talking about virtue. Virtues are things like courage or generosity or prudence. So he really is thinking primarily in terms of the character of the individual rather than about individual actions. Unless you've taken a lot of ethics classes before, that's actually a very intuitive way of thinking about ethics. And I found that it generated lots of great discussions as you try to figure out what really is courage? How do we know someone's being courageous as opposed to reckless? Those are the kinds of questions that get really good discussions going. And especially if you can read these books with a few other people, you'll find that you're able to kind of engage in that Socratic method that I talked about before. Now, before we go on to our next couple of books, I wanna talk about today's sponsor, which is Shortform. Shortform makes some of the best guides to nonfiction books. They have a way in their guides of really getting to the main points of books that as I've been reviewing what they have, I've actually found pretty helpful. Short form is useful if you're interested in philosophy or self-improvement or history. All sorts of nonfiction books are available in their catalog. Short form is not just regurgitating information or trying to get it so that you don't have to read the book. They're trying to help you understand what is going on in that book, either by making connections to other works or providing exercises for you to do to sort of test your own understanding. Short form is also very useful for helping figure out the main ideas of books so you can decide if you wanna go and read those books yourself. With so many nonfiction books being published every single year, it can be incredibly difficult to keep up or to decide what you want to read. So I've been using short form to get an idea of whether or not a book is worth it in the first place. I find that's going to save a lot of time. It's gonna prevent me from buying books that I don't end up finishing and it's going to allow me to focus my reading on what really matters to me. And short form can also be used to review books that you've read. So go and read a book and then use short forms guides as a kind of note taking or a kind of review process so you can make sure that you're really imbibing that information and you're really learning stuff rather than just your eyes going across the page. So to get a free trial to short form and a 25% discount, you can go to shortform.com slash Jared and there is a link down below. So after you have read some Plato and some Aristotle, I'm going to recommend that you read Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. The other books that I've recommended have primarily been works of ethics, so dealing with right and wrong. This is a work primarily of epistemology, which is about what we can know and what knowledge is. Epistemology, really briefly, is just the word for the study of knowledge. Descartes' idea is that knowledge should have a foundation, so there should be something which cannot be doubted, which for Descartes is the existence of thought, and then all other knowledge should be built up out of this. And from there, Descartes is able to draw some pretty radical conclusions, including a theory of the mind, which we have come to know as Cartesian dualism, which is an idea that the mind is a completely separate substance than the body, a non-physical substance. Now, as you read Descartes, I'm also going to recommend that you look into some of the objections and replies that Descartes received. And there's one I'd like to highlight in particular. This was written by Elizabeth, the Princess of Bohemia. When I've talked about Descartes on this channel before, I haven't talked about any of those replies in particular, and I haven't talked about Princess Elizabeth. But I was watching this video by Jeffrey Kaplan, which I'll link down below, and he really drove home why you should read this letter from Princess Elizabeth. Elizabeth reads Descartes, and she initiates a correspondence with him to ask him some hard questions about his philosophy. In particular, she's wondering how this whole mind-body dualism stuff is supposed to work. So Elizabeth writes, given that the soul of a human being is only a thinking substance, how can it affect the bodily spirits in order to bring about voluntary actions? Now, Elizabeth is asking Descartes a very difficult question. Uh, I think Kaplan described it as going straight to the heart of Descartes' philosophy and blowing the whole thing up. And I don't know if it blows the whole thing up, but it at least raises such a difficult question that anyone who's putting forward like a theory like Descartes needs to be able to answer it. And so they initiate this long correspondence. I think they corresponded for almost a decade. I'm going to link down to a free version of all of their letters, by the way, from a site called Early Modern Text, which is a great resource for students of philosophy. So while I don't know if this blows up Descartes, I will say that it shows philosophy as it should be done. It's illustrating that Socratic method that we talked about before. A theory has been offered, and now people are asking difficult questions in pursuit of the truth, together, figuring it out. And I just love this example. Okay, so the next book is slightly cheating because it's not a book per se, 
but a collection of essays by a philosopher known as Thomas Nagel. Nagel is a contemporary philosopher. We're going quite forward in history at this point, but there are two essays in particular that I have taught to introductory students that I think are so great at illustrating some really relevant, interesting philosophical problems that I think they'll hook you even if some of the other readings haven't. So the first one is called The Absurd, and Nagel is trying to answer this question of why does life sometimes feel absurd? Nagel thinks that a lot of philosophers have been right to sense that absurdity kind of seems to surround us, but he also notes that a lot of the time the arguments for why life is absurd have been pretty bad and they've often failed. In that essay, he's trying to give an explanation for what absurdity could be, and he also wants to deal with this more existential question of what ought we to do about it once we figured out why life feels absurd. Nagel is just demonstrating a great example of modern philosophy where he is finding a topic of really great general interest and then trying to explore it with clarity and with rigor while not compromising on style. He's actually very fun to read. The second essay takes a totally different turn and it's into the philosophy of mind, maybe even into a subject that we call phenomenology, and that is what is it like to be a bat? And this is where Nagel is exploring the, what it is like to have a conscious experience of something and whether or not we are able to properly conceive of what it's like to be a creature whose sensory faculties are totally different than our own. I've also found that there are just some students for whom the rest of philosophy can seem very boring, but when they get into philosophy of mind, they just light up. They just become incredibly engaged and they're very, very interested in the things here. So I wanted to include a little bit more philosophy of mind in this list than in any other list that I've done in the past. You could read the rest of the essays in Nagel's collection, by the way, but I would definitely recommend, above all, The Absurd and What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Oh, and just that, for nostalgia's sake, what is it like to be a bat was I think the third philosophical essay that I was ever assigned in class. I think the first three would have been the Euthyphro, uh, something by Augustine on, like on the teacher, I believe was the, the, uh, the essay. And then the third one was what is it like to be a bat? Um, I'm very thankful to my introductory philosophy professor for his great selection of books. Um, and it feels so cool to then recommend a book that helped get me hooked on philosophy years ago. And the final book is not a classic by any stretch of the imagination. This is Private Government by Elizabeth Anderson. Elizabeth Anderson is a contemporary philosopher, has done a lot of work in feminism and political philosophy. Private government doesn't seem like it would be of interest to lots of people. It's about a very niche topic about sort of business relationships and the ethics of relationships between employers and employees. And I don't mean intimate relationships there. I just mean the act of being employed and how much control employers have over our lives. But I find that this book taught really well. I actually taught an introduction to ethics class and I used this for part of the class and students responded very, very well. For one, you're going to have a job and you are almost certainly going to have a boss. And thinking about the ethics of having a job and having a boss is something that's worth doing. Two, Anderson is just writing really great philosophy here that's also intellectually grounded in history. So she's going to give you a bit of an introduction to political philosophy. And she's trying to explain how mindsets towards work shifted from Smith to Marx, for instance. And third, at the end of this book, there are replies from other philosophers trying to explain what Anderson did well or didn't do well. And then Anderson herself responds to the replies. So again, we're seeing that illustration of the Socratic method. And if you were trying to read through this book and then you wanted to maybe test your chops and see how you're developing as a philosopher, I would try to formalize some of the arguments, see what the objections actually are to Anderson's work, how she responds to them, and then figure out, do you agree with the response or actually with the critic or are they both missing the point somehow? This is how you start to engage in that great conversation. The goal of a philosophical education should not be to just remember the facts about what other philosophers have read or have said. Instead, it should be about getting you to be a participant in asking these big questions. If you read these five books, I think you will be well on your way.